time for today's Bible reading. I'm so glad you joined me. Today I'm reading Esther 1 through 5, brand new book. So we're really speeding through these, these last couple. Let me see what the next one looks like here on my chart. Okay, next one's Job. So Job, Psalms, Proverbs, they're all a little longer. And then we get into um, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon's only one reading. And then we get into the major and minor prophets. So today, though, <laughs> I don't know how I got off onto that. Today we're starting the book of Esther, only two days worth of reading for this book. So like I said, I'm so glad you joined me. Let me pray now. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. I ask that you come alongside us with your spirit as we read and listen and reveal your word to us in truth. This word is dead and dry without the spirit. We need you, Lord. We need your word and we need your spirit. Come in our lives. Come in our day. Come in this moment, these moments as we read. And uh, we sit at your feet, Master. Open our eyes to this to this very simple yet profound book that we're about to embark on. And Lord, I pray for every person that listens to this, for them, their families, to be saved and filled with your spirit, to be safe, and to be fully provided for and for wellness. I thank you, Lord, that your word says that you heal all our diseases, that as we, we come into the unity with you, you bless our food and water and take all sickness from our midst. I thank you for this precious word, your precious promises. Not one of them has ever failed. And I thank you that today is the same. Your mercies are new every day. So I just thank you for all that, Lord. Thank you for these moments here, Lord. And we just put everything aside to concentrate on your word right now. In Jesus' name. Verse 1. Now in the days of ah, I used to be able to say this, Aha Surus. Ahasuerus, there it is, Ahasuerus. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus who reigned from India even to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. Boy, that's quite a big empire, isn't it? Um, in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Susa, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast for all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the prin provinces, being before him. He displayed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even 180 days. When these days were fulfilled, the king made a seven-day feast for all the people who were present in Susa. It's calling it Susa the palace. Isn't that interesting? So that's the second time it said that. So it said, for all the people who were present in Susa the palace, both great and small, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were hangings of white and blue material fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and marble pillars. The couches were gold and silver on a pavement of red, white, yellow, and black marble. They gave them drinks and golden vessels of various kinds, including royal wine in abundance, according to the bounty of the king. In accordance with the law, the drinking was not compulsory, for so the king had instructed all the officials of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Now let me stop for a minute. You see all that elaborate furnishings and decorations? You know, we have a we have a tendency to think back in history and think they were all wearing um, you know, goat skin and living in caves and, you know, these civilizations, these are ancient and they were quite elaborate and quite developed. They weren't, you know, how do I say? Even though I imagine at that time that they were still tribal um, and traveling uh, groups of people. It doesn't mean there weren't, that these empires weren't, how do I say? I mean, we all know that there were these great empires back then, but we tend to think of it, those years at this, you know, at the same exact time, tend to think of those years as being very primitive and they weren't. That's my point. Um, verse nine. Also, Vashti the queen made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to King Ahasuerus. 
On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abag... Oh, that's a tough one. Abagtha, Zether, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who were who served in the presence of Hasserus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the royal crown to show the people and the princes her beauty, for she was beautiful. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by the eunuchs. Therefore the king was very angry, and his anger burned in him. So she humiliated him in front of everyone. Verse 13, then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for it was the king's custom to consult those who knew law and judgment. And next to him were Karshina, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. What shall we do to King Vashti according to the law, because she has not done the bidding of the king Ahasuerus by the eunuchs? Memucum answered before the king and the princess, Vashti the queen has not done wrong to just the king, but also to all the princes and to all the people who are in all the provinces of the king of Ahasuerus. For this deed, the queen will become known to all women, causing them to show contempt for their husbands when it is reported. King Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she didn't come. Today, the princesses of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's deed, will tell all the king's princes this will cause much contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal commandment go from him and let it be written among the law of the Persians and the Medes so that it cannot be altered that Vashti may never come before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal estate to another who is better than she. When the king's decree which he shall make is published throughout all his kingdom, for it is great, all the wives will give their husbands honor, both great and small. This advice pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucum, for he sent letters into all the king's princes excuse me, he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to its writing, and to every people in their language, that every man should rule his own house, speaking in the language of his own people. After these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was pacified, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what was decreed against her. Then the king's servants who served him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom that they may gather together the beautiful young virgins to the citadel of Susa, to the woman's house, to the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, keeper of the women. Let cosmetics be given them, and let the maiden who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. The thing pleased the king, and he did so. There was a certain Jew in the citadel of Susa, whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives, who had been carried away with Je Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. He brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his daughter, uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother. The maiden was fair and beautiful, and when her father and mother were dead, Mordecai took her for his own daughter. So when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together to the citadel of Susa to the custody of Haggai, Esther was taken into the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. The maiden, uh, the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness from him. He quickly gave her cosmetics and her portions of food, and the seven choice maidens who were to be given her out of the king's house. He moved her and her maidens to the best place in the women's house. Esther had not made known her people nor her relatives, because Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make it known. Mordecai walked every day in front of the court of the women's house to find out how Esther was doing and what would become of her. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after her purification for 12 months, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet fragrances and with preparations for beautifying women. Does that work? I think I need to get some of that. The young women then came to the king like this. Whatever she desired was given her to go with her out of the woman's house to the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the next day she returned into the second woman's house to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's unit who kept the concubines. She came into the king no more unless the king delighted in her and she was called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, 
came to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai the king's unit, the keeper of the women, advised. Esther obtained favor in the sight of all those who looked at her. Now, let me stop for a minute. There's a book by Tommy Tenney. Um, hold on. thought I had it here on my shelf, but um, was it Tommy Tunney that did that? There's a movie called One Night with the King, and then may have a book, but there is also a book by Tommy Tunney that is a modern-day rendition of this story. Um, no, I'm telling that wrong. Let's just go back to the movie. There's a movie called One Night with the King that's really good. You can look that up. <laughs> I don't know where to find it. But anyway, it's a good one. It's worth watching. All right, back to the reading. Sometimes when I try to say things ad, ad lib on this um, reading channel, it gets, a little, it gets a little off. All right, back to this. Um, so it says she took, oh, well, that's what, this is what triggered that thought of the movie. In the movie, it showed, you know, all the, this room, this treasure room that the eunuch took them in, and there was all the jewelry and beautiful um, things that the women could adorn themselves with. And it showed some of the women going in there kind of brash, kind of greedy, you know, and really dolling themselves up. And then it showed when Esther went in, she was very simple, very plain. She just picked out something very delicate, you know, um, and that's it. She just, she was just kind of simple and pure and and, um, you know, just depicts her being kind of innocent that way. So that's that's what I just read here. It said, um, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, came to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the keeper of the women, advised. Esther obtained favor in the sight of all those who looked at her. So Esther was taken to the king as Ahasuerus into his royal house in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the women, and she obtained favor and kindness in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast for all his princes and his servants, even Esther's feast, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the king's bounty. When the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate. Esther had not yet made known her relatives nor her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai like she did when she was brought up by him. In those days, while Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate, two of the king's units, eunuchs, Big Than and Teresh, who were doorkeepers, were angry and sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. The thing became known to Mordecai, who informed Esther the queen, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. When this matter was investigated, it was found to be so. They were both hanged on a gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. All the king's servants who were in the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai didn't bow down or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were there in the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's commandment? Now it came to pass when they spoke daily to him, and he didn't listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordecai didn't bow down nor pay him homage, Haman was full of wrath. But he scorned the thought of laying hands on Mordecai alone, for they had made known to him Mordecai's people. Therefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even Mordecai's people. In the seventh month, which is Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pure, he you are, that is, the lot before Haman from day to day and from month to month and chose the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples. In all the provinces of your kingdom, and their laws are different from other people's. They don't keep the king's laws. There it is not, for, excuse me, therefore it is not for the king's profit to allow them to remain. 
If it pleases the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver into the hands of those who are in charge of the king's business to bring it into the king's treasuries. The king took his ring from off his hand and gave it to him and the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the Jew's enemy. The king said to Haman, The silver is given to you, the people also, to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king... The king's scribes were called in on the first month and on the thirteenth day of the month, and all that Haman commanded was written to the king's local governors and to the governors who were over every province and to the princes of every people, to every province according to its writing, and to every people in their language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus, and it was sealed with the king's ring. Letters were sent by couriers excuse me, couriers into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to plunder their possessions. A copy of the letter that the decree should be given out in every province was published to all the peoples that they should be ready against that day. The couriers went out in haste by the king's commandment, and the decree was given out in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was perplexed. Now when Mordecai found out that all was done, Mordecai tore his clothes, put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the middle of the city, and wailed loudly and bitterly. He came even before the king's gate, for no one is allowed inside the king's gate, clothed with sackcloth. In every province, Wherever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Esther's maidens and her eunuchs came and told her this, and the queen was exceedingly grieved. She sent clothing to Mordecai to replace his sackcloth, but he didn't receive it. Then Esther called for half that, one of the king's, or maybe it's Hatach, one of the king's eunuchs whom he had appointed to attend her, and commanded him to go to Mordecai to find out what this was and why it was. So Hatach went out to Mordecai to the city square, which was before the king's gate. Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given out in Susa to destroy them to show it to Esther and to declare to her, to declare it to her and to urge her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to make requests before him for her people. Hatach came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hatach and gave him a message to Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that whoever whether man or woman, comes to the king to the inner court without being called, there is one law for him, that he be put to death, except those to whom the king might hold out the golden scepter that he may live. I have not been called to come into the king these thirty days. They told Esther's words to Mordecai, then Mordecai asked them to return this answer to Esther. Don't think to yourself that you will escape in the king's house any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent now, then relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Who knows if you haven't come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Boy, he had faith, didn't he? Then Esther asked them to answer Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are present in Susa and fast for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I and my maidens will also fast the same way. Then I will go into the king, which is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai, well, she must have been terrified. Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Chapter five, last chapter. Now on the third day, Esther put on her royal clothing and stood in the inner court of the king's house next to the king's house. The king sat on his royal throne in the royal house next to the entrance of the house. When the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, she obtained favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther came near and touched the top of the scepter. Then the king asked her, What would you like, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given unto you even up to half of the kingdom. Esther said, If it seems good to the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. 
Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that it may be done as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. The king said to Esther at the banquet of wine, what is your petition? It shall be granted you. What is your request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it shall be performed. Then Esther answered and said, my petition and my request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I will prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Then Haman went out by that day joyful and glad of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and he didn't stand nor move for him, he was filled with wrath against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. There he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh. Uh, Zeresh's wife, Haman recounted to them the glory of his riches, the multitude of his children, all the things of which the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman also said, Yes, Esther the queen, let no man come in with the king to the banquet that she had prepared but myself, and tomorrow I am also invited by her together with the king. Yet all this avails me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends said to him, Let a gallows be made, fifty cubits high. Let's see how tall that is. Uh, a cubit is the length from the tip of the middle finger to the elbow on a man's arm, or about 18 inches. So 18 inches times 50. <clears throat> so, yeah, so what is that, about 200? If it's 20 inches times 50... Um, anyway, it says gallows here, but I thought it was actually a pole that one would be impaled on. <clears throat> comment, make a comment if you have an idea about that. Anyway, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high and in the morning speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on it. Then go in merrily with the king to the banquet. This pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. And that is the end of today's reading. Thanks for joining. See you tomorrow. Shalom.